the shooting range. In this episode, Pages of History, German Problem Engines, Triathlon, Earliest Twin-Engined Bombers, and Metal Beasts, Chasing the Tornado. Today we'd like to continue discussing the new vehicles, and what we've got here is another top-tier machine. The European family of multi-role aircraft was missing something better adapted for air combat, so... Please welcome the Panavia Tornado F3, found in the British tech tree. Its power plant is a twin bypass turbofan engine with afterburners. Self-sealing fuel tanks are found in the fuselage, the wings, and the vertical fins. Additional fuel can be stored in two external drop tanks. The nose cone hides an advanced radar system, while under the cockpit we can spot a forward-firing 27mm autocannon with an ammo pool of 180 rounds. For air combat, the Tornado can carry up to eight close and medium-range missiles. The first difference between this model and earlier machines is the more powerful engine. The gap isn't too big, especially when compared to the German Strike version. But this is a fighter that doesn't need to carry heavy bombs, so we can certainly call it one of the fastest planes in the game. And that's about it, in terms of flight performance advantages. If you're piloting a tornado, you'd better forget turn fights exist. Even the starfighters feel more maneuverable in comparison. The modest flight performance of this European aircraft is compensated by the quality of its onboard devices. For instance, the radar system can cover all possible needs and wants. It's very hard to hide from the predatory sight of the tornado, and everyone who fails to do so will have to say hello to the Sky Flash Super Temp missiles, unique in War Thunder. Their best competitors can only boast a longer range, so suffice it to say, it's a very reliable and effective weapon. If the enemy does manage to get closer, you can send some all-aspect AIM-9Ls their way. This new vehicle can also boast a ballistic computer for forward-firing armament, much like the one's top fighters have. We have to admit, though, that even the computer can't help you much with accuracy on a plane as hard to maneuver as the Tornado. The fuel load this aircraft can carry is pretty impressive compared to its competition, especially with the drop tanks. It will last even the longest battle when most opponents have to go back to base to refuel. The number of countermeasures is also enjoyable, totaling 352. Since this plane's main tactic involved a lot of flying straight and speeding away, you can't overestimate the importance of this. In mixed battles, the strike versions of the Tornado are still more efficient. This plane lost its cast potential after becoming an interceptor. Germans have long been famous for their engines. If you went shopping for one in the 1930s, you had a long list of companies to visit. Daimler-Benz, Krupp, Junkers, Porsche, and so on. One thing was off, though. With so many brands and projects to pick from, almost all German tanks and many armored cars used Maybach engines exclusively. Even the early Panzer I, which had an opposed piston engine borrowed from a truck, was later redesigned with a Maybach. Sounds like a real monopoly, don't you think? Well, there was a reason for that. German tanks were made by various companies, but their development was supervised by the weapons agency. Its specialists looked for the best solutions and then commissioned the manufacturing. Picking engines was their responsibility too. In the early 1930s, Germans were looking for some fresh models to be equipped on new trucks and tanks. The Maybach company proposed suitable solutions that were both powerful and compact, and with a great length to boot. It was simply perfect for tanks. The weapons agency would order from Maybach again and again until the firm became a monopoly. At first, there was no glaring issue. The engines had a high quality and satisfied the army's needs. But with time, this enthusiasm kind of went down a little. With more and more engines produced, the line got unbelievably large. For instance, the line of half-track trucks had six machines with a unique engine for each. Moreover, some of these unique engines only had a difference of 5 to 10 horsepower. 
Servicing such a huge vehicle line was a true pain, even in peacetime. However, there was another problem. Maybach never managed to fix the HL230 engine, the one used on the Tigers and the Panthers. It took so much time and effort that it might deserve a separate story, but here's the gist. Back in the mid-1930s, the Germans were polishing their 300-horsepower strong engine for the Panzers 3 and 4, knowing full well that tanks would soon breach the 30-ton limit and require an engine with 600 or 700 horsepower. Of course, one cannot simply go and double an engine's power. Maybach engineers spent six years creating prototypes. Finally, in 1941, they presented the HL210 with 650 horsepower. It was installed onto the first Tigers and Panthers and became infamous pretty much instantly. The 210 was heating up way past its limit. Extracting 30 horsepower from each liter of volume was no joke. The pistons moved at ludicrous speed, more than 14 meters a second. The engine required superb cooling and an extremely high build quality. Adjusting its four carburetors was a real art. Should we even mention that this model would break down all the time during the war? Well, a year later, a successor was made, the famous HL230. The makers gave it a bigger volume and finally reached the coveted 700 horsepower. But at what price? The engine would overheat, the carburetors would fire up, the gaskets would fail, and the intricate parts would simply crack. The Germans never fixed the issues and resorted to extreme measures. Their engineers reduced the compression rates and limited the RPM lowering the total power output to 600 horsepower. That was a dead end. Even 700 horsepower was too little for the 70-ton King Tiger, let alone 600. What could be done? The solution was found in air-cooled diesel engines. But that's a story for another time. You asked us in the comments, and we deliver. Today's triathlon won't have the newest top-tier vehicles. Instead, it'll feature veterans that entered service in the first half of the 20th century. Please welcome the first twin-engine bombers. The B-18A and the Dornier 17E1, the SB-2M100 and the Blenheim Mark IV, the Key-21 1A and the Martin 139WC, the BR-20DR and the Pote 633, the B-3C and the first Israeli twin-engined bomber, the Vautour. Haha, <laughs> the Vautour will not take part. Or will it? Okay, let's check the maximum speed of our contestants first. Everybody ready? Go! The bombers take off and keep close to the ground to gain speed. Even before the takeoff strip is over, the Japanese plane gets the lead and starts breaking away. The British and the Soviet planes are second and third, respectively. The rest of the planes are going with almost equal gaps between them, with the German team flying the last. The second stage will test the defensive armament of our bombers. A couple of I-15s will be attacking them, one from the front and another one from the rear. The French pilot drew the first match. It does reflect the frontal attack, albeit with some effort, but defending the rear seems tricky. The gunner can only shoot above the fuselage, so half of the rear is a blind spot. The Dornier, the Martin, and the B-3C have lower rear turrets, so they fare better. The British and the Japanese planes use their twin MG turrets in the rear to great success, but they suffer in the front. The B-18 and the BR-20 are doing better, their top guns can fire both forward and backward. And finally, the strongest defenses are shown by the Soviet SB-2. Its machine guns have a superior fire rate. Finally, let's compare the loads and the bombing efficiency of our teams. We'll have four Panzer 3E tanks for main targets and 20 open-top SPAAGs for light bombs. Some French tractors would be just fine. This time, the worst result is shown by the British aircraft. It destroys two tanks in the first group, switches to a smaller caliber, and handles four anti-aircraft guns. 
the Martin and the SB2 do a little better. Their result includes two tanks and six SPAAGs each. The French Pote and the German Dornier improved their overall score. Both hit two tanks, then the former hit eight anti-aircraft guns, while the latter, ten. The rest of the contestants go above and beyond and leave no tank intact. After reloading, the Italian and the American planes destroy a dozen more targets, the Swedish one scores 16, and the best result here is shown by the Japanese bomber. It manages to clear the entire target pool. Time to sum up. The bronze goes to the American B-18A for its good defenses and decent bombs. The silver goes to the Soviet SB-2M for its high speed and the best turrets. And the winner today is the Japanese Ki-21. With the best speed performance and the most versatile bomb load, this is the most balanced early bomber. Well, it's time to give the old timers some rest. Meanwhile, we'll answer some of the questions you ask us in the comments. The first question was sent by a player called Drillon. How do you use the Helldiver in the most optimal way? Hi Drillon, you can actually use this aircraft even as a fighter in air battles. Start the battle by climbing towards the enemy and attack with an altitude advantage. Don't shy away from frontal attacks or turn fights. The Helldiver can stand its ground. As for mixed battles, the SB-2C is similar to other strike aircraft, so no unique tactic is required. Slicerax asks, can you do an arsenal section for the A1H? Hi there, Slicerax. It's one of the main contenders for the next arsenal. Another question comes from Sichoi. What's the fastest jet that can reach Mach 1, starting from takeoff? Hi there. The fastest jet to reach Mach 1 right now is the Yak-141. Its result is around 30 seconds. Thunderhaunts writes, What's the best aircraft to ground attack with, the P-47 or the Typhoon? Hi again, Thunderhaunts. The Thunderbolt is certainly better for ground attacks. Most P-47 modifications can carry up to three bombs and ten rockets, which can score you more targets than any Typhoon loadout. Still, we can't say that the British plane is a poor choice for Cass. And the last comment for today was written by Arda Baran. Is it possible to hit ground units with an air-to-air -air missile? Hi there, Arda. It's possible in theory if the missile locks onto an aerial target and hits a tank by accident, but it's nigh impossible to pull off in practice, especially in a random battle. That's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. Don't forget to check the gaskets on your tank's Maybach, leave a like, share your thoughts and comments, and see you next week.